great to have all of you here this morning. You looking good out there? And, uh, I'm excited about this day. We, uh, get to go dive into His Word together for a few moments and have some fellowship afterwards and watch the joy of the children as they run all over the, in the backyard and enjoy themselves. This morning, I want to start off by asking you to do something. I want you to think about Jesus. Is that okay? Can everybody handle that? I want you to think about Jesus. That's what this day is all about. Amen? Cheryl and I went to uh, pick up a, an Easter card. I want you to know out of all those cards, we could not find one thing about Jesus. Now, I'm not against all the other stuff, but I do believe the focus is Jesus. Amen? But when you're thinking about Jesus, I want you to do this just for a moment. I want you to close your eyes and I want you to get a picture of Jesus right now. Would you do that? Just get a picture. And make sure you have them because I might call on you to ask you what your picture is, okay? So everybody just take a moment. Just get a picture of Jesus. Let them just come before your mind right there. Are you ready? Okay. Bev, tell me, describe your picture of Jesus. A lamb? Beth saw him as a lamb. Michelle, tell me your picture, would you? Uh, risen. Risen. See Jesus risen. I asked for another volunteer. Who volunteered to tell me your picture? Hmm? I hear somebody? It's a lot easier whenever I call on you, isn't it? Eric's still trying to get that picture. He's already fell asleep one, I'm not sure. His eyes are shut, he's just sitting there. All right, let me just ask maybe one more. Uh, who can I ask? John, what's your picture of Jesus? King? Victorious King. Okay, so whenever I ask you to get a, a picture of Jesus, you can see there are several different pictures. You know, if it were Christmas time, Probably somebody would have raised their hand and said, you know, I see him as a baby in a manger. I mean, that, that's a common picture that we have of Jesus around Christmas time. And it, this being Easter, some of you may have saw him on a cross. Some of you, as, as someone had mentioned, saw him risen. And then others saw him as king and yet even better king of kings and lord of lords. So perhaps you saw him in a lot of different ways. You might have even seen him as a, with a smile on his face. That's one of my favorite pictures of Jesus. And I think uh, Jesus had a sense of humor, contrary to what some people might think. But that's not the only picture you ever see of Jesus smiling. But I think you know he had the ultimate joy of life, even though he gave the ultimate sacrifice. But I, I like that picture of him smiling. Where you know, I like especially when he's talking about judging and. He says, you know, don't try to get, you know, you're trying to get that splinter out of somebody's eye and you got this big plank in your own eye. And I think that's a funny picture if you think about it, this big old plank coming out of somebody's eye. I think he might even smile when he said that because I believe that's the nature uh, of Jesus. But this morning, we're not necessarily going to look at Jesus in a, in a manger. We're not going to look at him on the cross. Uh, we're not even going to look at him uh, being resurrected Raising from the dead, rising from the dead. But I want us to go a little further than that, and I want us to look at the resurrected, ascended Jesus that John the Revelator describes in Revelation uh, chapter one. And I'm going to read to you verses nine through eighteen. So would you listen closely as I read, beginning with verse nine? And it reads there, I John both your brother and companion in the tribulation and kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ was on the island that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. In other words, he was sent there as a prisoner because of his testimony for Jesus. He says, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day and I heard behind me a loud voice as of a trumpet saying, I am the Alpha and Omega, first and the last. 
And what you see, write in a book and send it to the seven churches which are in Asia, Ephesus, to Smyrna, to Pergamos, to Thyatira, to Sardis, to Philadelphia, and to Laodicea. Then I turned to see the voice that spoke with me, and having turned, I saw seven gold lampstands, and in the midst of the seven lampstands, one like the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the feet, and girded about the chest with a golden band, his head and hair were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were like fine grass, as if refined in the furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. He had in his right hand seven stars, out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was like the sun shining in strength. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. But he laid his right hand on me, saying to me, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am he who lives and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And I have the keys of Hades and death. So this is the description I want you to see this morning. But before we get into that description, I want you to notice what John had done. It says he was afraid and fell at his feet. Now you have to understand, John had an intimate relationship with Jesus. I mean, today we would say they were BFFs, amen? I mean, he was not only one of the twelve, but he was one of the three closest ones to Jesus while he was here on this earth. And when his eyes fell on that risen Savior, that ascended and glorified Christ, the majesty was too much for him to handle. It reminds me of a song that many of you might be familiar with, uh, sang by Mercy Me. And that song goes kind of like this. Surrounded by your glory, what will my heart feel? Will I dance before you, Jesus, or in awe of you be still? Will I stand in your presence, or to my knees will I fall? Will I sing hallelujah? Will I be able to speak at all? I can only imagine. I want you to think about that for a moment. Think, I, I think John answers that question for us. Here John was his best friend, probably, and it says, John fell at his feet. You know, we are very familiar with Jesus. I mean, and, and, and I'm all for this. Here we talk about Jesus as our friend. How many know He's your friend? Amen? Matter of fact, the Bible says He's a friend that sticks closer than any brother. He's, he's our friend. Uh, not only that, but we talk about how wonderful His grace is. And church, without His grace, none of us would be here. Thank God for the grace that He extends to us. He tells us uh, uh, about His love. And we talk about the love of Jesus. And church, that is true. And that is the Gospel. His grace is all-powerful, all-sufficient. His love is abounding. He is our friend. But I think somewhere along the way, we we sometimes lose the majesty of who He is. We lose what is described to us here in Revelations, how Jesus looks today, the ascended Lord. What does He say about Him? First of all, He said, I see one like the Son of Man. I see one like the Son of Man. It was a glorified physical body. Now, I do not necessarily believe it was flesh and blood, but it was rather the form of man. In like manner, to the best of my understanding, uh, we uh, will not necessarily have flesh and blood, but we'll have human form. I understand that we will recognize one another in heaven. I understand that we will be recognized in heaven. So those that have gone before you, that have gone to heaven, when you go to heaven, listen, you will recognize them. You will have 
a relationship then with them, but the relationship you have then will go so far beyond any type of relationship you ever had with them here. That's hard for us to understand because we're talking about eternal things. We're, we're talking about things that are going to be so different but so much better. You see, heaven's not just a story. Heaven is for real. Amen? Heaven is, is, is something that our hope is resting in. The, the hope of heaven. And the reason we have the hope of heaven is because of this day right here. This day that we are celebrating today. You see, Jesus could have died a thousand deaths, but if He did not rise again, it would all be in vain. It says if He hasn't risen, our, our hope is vain. I mean, we, we have no hope. We have no uh, uh, chance. But because of what He did for us, we now have this hope of heaven. Amen? It says... He was wearing a robe down to his feet. He was dressed in his own righteousness. You know, Jesus is the only one that can dress in his own righteousness. We put on his righteousness. Amen. Hallelujah. It tells us over in Corinthians, it says, uh, uh, He who knew no sin, talking about Jesus, became sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in Christ. Church, this is the greatest trade ever offered anytime, anywhere, that Jesus took upon Himself our sin. Your sin, my sin, past sins, future sins. He took it all upon Himself. Sometimes we think about the terrible physical condition of His body when He died on that cross. Uh, if you ever saw the Passion of Christ, I mean, that was awful, but that doesn't even begin to describe uh, the, the beating that He took the Bible tells us that he was beat beyond recognition. As a matter of fact, it says you could not even tell that he was a human being. He was beaten so bad. But yet, that is not even our focus. We thank God for, for his death and his sacrifice and paying the price for our sin. However, what really matters is that he rose from that grave. Nobody else has risen from the dead at that time, you see. But He rose from the grave by His own power, by the power of the Holy Spirit. And, and He is seated at the right hand of God today, making intercession for you and for me. But that is why we're here today. That's why we are celebrating. Yes, we celebrate every Sunday. Every Sunday is Resurrection Day. But this is the day we set apart to say, Today! Our focus is on Him. But I want to go beyond, as I said before, that, that death on the cross. I want to go beyond the resurrection. I want to go uh, beyond the ascension to where we see Jesus in heaven in all His glory. And He is clothed in His own righteousness this morning. Can somebody say amen? amen. He goes on to say, He was girded or fastened with a golden band or belt. That speaks of His authority. Kings and priests would dress in this manner. It signified their authority. I remember Jesus once said over in Matthew chapter 28, He said, all authority, all authority, both in heaven and on earth, have been given unto Me. Jesus has been given all authority. And church, that's, it doesn't stop there, but... You know what he said right after that? He said, now you go in my name. What he's saying is, I'm delegating authority to you. You go in my name and you lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. You go in my name and you shall cast out devils and speak with new tongues. You go in my name. He says, you'll even raise the dead. That's because he went on to be with the Father. Amen. But you see, there's coming a time when we go into heaven. He... Uh, will, will retain all that authority both in heaven and on earth and even things beneath the earth. Amen? Then he goes on to describe this Jesus, this resurrected, ascended Jesus. And he says His head and hair were white like wool, as white as snow. Now there are differences of opinions on what this means. Some say the white hair represents wisdom as of the ancient of days. You know how gray hair uh, speaks of wisdom. You see, you don't know if I'm wise or not. You know, but, but you just got to guess. But at any rate, it also says his head and hair are white. Now, 
that, that makes me think he's talking about the radiance that shone forth from him. He's talking about brightness, resplendence, similar to what we saw or heard about in the book of Matthew, in the Gospel of Matthew, concerning the transfiguration of Christ. Let me read that to you and see if this doesn't sound familiar. Matthew 17 and verse 2. Listen to what it says there. It says, And He was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun, and His clothes became as white as the light. I think that's just talking about the glory that is just shining forth. And, and, and right now, He has this brilliance about Him. There's a glory that is he just white in splendor. And He goes on to say, His eyes like a flame of fire. You know, the eyes can say a lot. You know, the parents can just look at their child sometimes. Can any of you children remember that when you were children? Mama has a way of just looking at you. No words are needed. You just know you're in trouble. Or you know you're loved. Amen? They just have a way, and that doesn't always separate. Sometimes you can be in trouble because they love you. Amen? But the eyes can say a lot. You know, even a wife's eyes can tell you. You know, you heard of the women giving that evil eye? You know you done messed up when they give you that eye. But then there's also the eyes of your little daughter or your granddaughter. Oh, that can just melt your heart. Amen? When they just look at you a certain way. So the eyes really do tell us a lot. But here it says, His eyes were like a flame of fire. It tells us in 1 Corinthians 3.13, it says, Every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. Now church, this is talking about the Christian here. This is where the Christian stands before Jesus. And Jesus will look at the Christian and will be able to judge according to rewards. Do you know you will receive rewards in heaven? See, that's awesome. You see, church, we have to remember as believers, this is not our home. It tells us that we're sojourners. We're pilgrims. We're just passing through. Sometimes we put way too much stock in this world. This world is not our home. Our home is a heavenly home. Amen? And, and we're going to be here 50 or 60. I'm trying to cut it a little short, aren't I? We're going to be here 70, 80, 90. Maybe a few will make it to 100. But even 100 years compared to eternity is such a short time. This is not our home. We should have our eyes upward toward heaven looking for the eternal things. Amen? And it tells us that we can send our rewards ahead of us. But you see, sometimes we think we're doing things that are going to be rewarded. And I don't think it's bad to look for rewards. That's just an act of faith. Amen? That's saying I truly believe in what I'm saying here. I truly believe in what I'm talking about. And, and we, we send our rewards ahead of us. You know, many people say you can't take it with you. Yeah, you can. You just can't take it in the coffin with you. Amen? But you can send it on ahead. But you see, sometimes we do things, but we do them for the wrong motives. You know, we want to give, let's say, money in, into the kingdom. We want to, you know, we want to you know, provide for the church and we have a place where people can come and learn and worship and do all these different things. Well, you know, if you're doing it from your heart, to give them to the Lord uh, through these things, well, you get a reward for that. But you know, if you uh, if you you know you write you a check out for a thousand dollars, and by the way, if you wrote one out for a thousand, we thank you for that. But but if, you know, if you walk around and say, "Hey, look what I did! I gave a thousand dollars today. Look at me! You got your reward, Amen." Because your heart is to be seen by man. But if you're just doing this saying, Lord, I love you, and I just want to see your kingdom grow, and I love, you know, I love this church, and I just want to give to you through here, and whatever. Now we've already taken the offering, okay? So we're not building up for a big offering this morning. But I'm just saying your motive. Or if you do something for somebody, if you do it to be seen and praised by man, you've received your reward. But if you do it for the glory of God, then you are sending your reward ahead of you. Amen. 
But it says we'll stand before God. This is not like God's getting or Jesus is getting mad at you or anything. It's just reward time. And when he looks at you, that which is pure will stand and you will be rewarded for it. And, and again, that's just another one of those things that his eyes can do, these eyes of fire. But on, on an even greater note, just as the fiery eyes can judge our works, the fiery eyes also reveal his love for the bride. There's a song we used to sing, it's called We Were Ride. Anybody know that song? Well, it goes something like this. It says, uh, you see that fire in his eyes? It is his love for his bride. And he's longing that you be with him, riding by his side. You see, he has a love for the bride. The church is the bride. And he, he's longing to be united with us in heaven. Amen? Next, John describes his feet. It says his feet were like fine grass, as if refined in a furnace. Uh, a furnace. Now, I'm sure it was okay to say this, and she gave me the approval. You know, a lot of times, you know, I had a pastor one time tell me, he said, you want to know the, the uh, attitude of your church? Look at your wife. Now, I don't know if that's true or not, so I, I sometimes will run stuff by her and just see how her reaction is. So I think I can get by with saying this, but probably unless you have a foot fetish, you're not attracted to someone's feet. Okay? Some feet can be downright ugly. However, Feet are very important, amen? I mean, uh, you know, try walking on gravel with bare feet. Now, when I was in the Boy Scouts, I was what they call a tenderfoot. And I don't think I ever made it much past that. You know, I, I, I go out and I get on that gravel and I'm like, ow, ow, ow. You know, it just hurts. I don't have tough feet. Now, you might run around bare, barefoot all the time and have tough feet. But feet are very important. And John tells us that the feet of Jesus were like fine grass signifying strength, signifying authority and glory. Now, now, here's the part that really I think about. He says, His voice as the sound of many waters. Cheryl and I, I think Tony mentioned our anniversary is coming up on the 14th. We'll be married. It's actually 31 years. We'll be married uh, on the 14th. And uh, on our 25th wedding anniversary, uh, we, uh, Cheryl and I went to Niagara Falls. First time we've ever been there. And it was an awesome sound. Anybody ever been to Niagara Falls? A few of you. It was an awesome, awesome sound. Especially if you went down by the bottom where the water's coming down. It's just a roar. And you can just feel the vibration of the sound of the water. You can feel the power. You know, with that voice, God spoke the world into existence. He said, light be, and light wasn't going to argue with him. Amen? That was a voice of authority. It was a voice of power. God said, light be. And light was. Light didn't say, I don't want to be. Light said, didn't say, I'll be when I'm good and ready to be. I mean, when God spoke, light be with that powerful voice, light obeyed and revealed itself. It says, out of his mouth went a sharp, two-edged sword. In Hebrews chapter 4, in verse 12, it reads, For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of the soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intent of the heart. This sword represents the Word of God. He speaks, whether it be on that day of judgment or whether it be today, the day of grace. God speaks. <coughs> it's the same voice. When God says, I offer grace, there's no denying it. There's no arguing. And thank God for today. It's a day of grace. It's a day of opportunity. Today is a day of salvation that He is freely offering to all of us. Amen? The Word of God. Then He goes on to say, His countenance was like the sun shining in its strength. His countenance flows 
through his face. And it's brilliant. You can't even see his face because of the intense light of his glory. And upon the sight of Jesus, John, Jesus, his best friend, fell down as dead. I've heard people talk. People are good at talking, aren't they? People are real good at talking like on Facebook, aren't they? Anybody have a Facebook account in here? I mean, people are like, I can't believe you said that. Don't you realize people are reading this? But people talk and they, they want to talk like they're all that. You know, they're all bad. And, uh, you know, I've heard people talk like that before. And they say, when I see God, I'm going to set Him straight on a few things. I think they might be in for a frightful surprise when they get a look and a sound of His voice. I tell you, church, we're not going to set God straight on anything. Because God has the authority. God has the power. But along with that authority and power, even more so, God has love. Amen? And He loves each and every one of us. But we see John, the one whom Jesus loved, his buddy, if you will. The sight of Jesus and all His glory was too much for John to take. He could not take it. As he lay there, it says, now here's, here's, this is good. He said, it says, Jesus laid his hand on him. And what did he say? Don't be afraid. Do not be afraid. Can you imagine standing before him? Church, one day you will. One day we'll all stand before him. He'll be revealed as the eternal God. Yet he's still the one that died for you. That eternal God and all His brilliance is the one that gave us life for each and every one of us. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son so that whoever would believe in Him would not perish but have everlasting life. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one will see the Father except through Me. He made a way to spend eternity with Him. He died for us. He was raised for us. For our justification. What does justification mean? It means that when we accept Christ as our Savior, it's just as if we've never sinned. You see, the Bible says in Romans, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. The Bible says again in Romans, for the wages of sin is death, eternal separation from God. But Jesus said the, the, the gift of God is eternal life. And He is offering eternal life to each and every one of us. And if we will receive that gift of life, we can know that we will spend eternity with Him. And even though when we look at Him, we will be in awe of Him. It might even be a fearful sight, but He's going to reach out to you and He's going to say, My child, don't be afraid. And all of a sudden, this peace is just going to come over you. Because you're going to realize, even though... He is majestic. He's your friend. Even though He is awesome and splendor, He loves you more than you could ever know. Because we have a relationship with Him. Now I will not be honest with you if I didn't add this part. If we do not have a relationship with Him, He will say, depart from me, you workers of iniquity, I never knew you. You see, it's a matter of whether or not we know Him. Do you know Him this morning? That's the question. Do you have a relationship with Him? If you don't, you can know that you have a relationship with Him today by receiving Him, accepting Him, accepting the gift of salvation that He freely offers us. The church not only will He touch you then, He wants to touch you now. He delights in reaches in reaching His hand out to touch us. And when He touches us, amazing things happen. If you need healing, He's your healer. If you need deliverance, He's your deliverer. If you have a financial need, He's your provider. Let's see Him in His glory. We don't have to wait until we see Him then. We can recognize Him in all His splendor, even today. We can know Him 
and we can see Him work powerful things in our lives. As we worship Him as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Amen. Hallelujah. I'd like to ask you to bow your head with me just for a moment. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Today you're standing before, or sitting before me, a mere servant, friend of the Lord. But I'm representing Him today. And I want to offer you His gift of salvation. This morning, if you cannot say that you know that you have a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, but you want to know, the Bible says today is the day of salvation. Now is the time. Well, how do I know that I'm saved? You simply receive the gift of salvation. You say, Lord, I know I'm a sinner. I ask you to forgive me, and I ask you for the gift of salvation. I ask you to come into my heart and my life. If that's you this morning, and that's your prayer this morning, I want you to just lift your hand very quickly. You can put it right back down. Thank you. Anybody else this morning? Just lift your hand very quickly. I want to pray a prayer. And if you pray this prayer with me and believe it in your heart, you can know that you are saved this morning. You can know that you have a relationship with Jesus Christ this morning. The King of kings and Lord of lords, He will be your best friend. Anybody else before we pray? Wait just one more moment. Just lift your hand if you would like to be included in that prayer. Hallelujah. Anybody else before we pray? Right. I would like to ask everybody in this room if you would join me, please, and repeat this prayer after me. And if you're praying this prayer and, and, and you believe it, you mean it, you can know that Jesus is coming into your heart and life right now. You can know that you have that gift of salvation. I want everybody to repeat this after me. Say, Father, thank you for sending Jesus to die upon a cross to pay the price for my sin. I thank you for rising from the dead for my justification. I receive you and your gift in Jesus' name. I pray. Amen. Now, if you prayed that prayer and you meant it, the Bible says, but as many as received him, what did you just do? You received him. But as many as received him to them, he gave the right to be called children of God, even to those that believe on his name. By praying that prayer, you're saying, I believe on your name. I believe you're raised from the dead. And I accept you and the gift that you provided for me. And church, you might be saying, that seems too easy. He didn't want to make it hard. It's all by faith. Amen. It's all by belief. Now, if you prayed that prayer and you meant it in your heart, here's one word of instruction I want to give to you. Find a Bible-believing church. A church that believes the Bible. Amen. And start attending regularly and learn more about this relationship. Because he came that you might have life and that more abundant. And he wants to give you that abundant life, but you have to renew your mind and understand what he wants to do for you. Amen. In order to receive that. If you don't have a church in mind, this is a Bible believing church. Amen. And you're more than welcome to join us. But if you have family or something that goes to a church somewhere and you'd like to join them, just find a Bible believing church. And uh, make a home there. Amen. Hallelujah. As I said earlier, just as he touched John and said, do not be afraid. We don't have to wait for him to touch us. There are some this morning, he just touched you. You lifted your hand and you said, I want to receive Christ. I want to receive the gift of salvation. The moment you said, prayed that, the moment you believed that, he touched you. There's a change, whether you recognize it yet or not. There's a change that took place 
in your heart. And I want you to recognize that change as the days come about. Amen? And he wants to touch you. Whatever you need this morning, I want you just to reach out to him and let him touch you. Amen? Jesus I is it. our bread of life. The Bible tells us by his stripes we are healed. We talk about what he endured to pay the price for our sin. And he tells us to do this often in remembrance of him. I want you to take just a moment and just think of him, the sacrifice that he made. But I don't want you to stop there. I want you to think about how he rose from the dead. It says he walked around for 40 days afterwards. Many witnesses saw him. This is not a fairy tale. This is factual. I don't have time to talk more about that today. But you know, it's faith, but it's not blind faith. And then he ascended to be with the Father. Many saw him ascend into the clouds. And we just looked at the description of where he is now. And I'm glad to say I'm a believer this morning. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. Because it is the power of God and salvation. Amen. Amen. And I want us to take a moment and just thank Him for all that He did. And if you feel led to do so, go ahead and partake together. Amen. Father, again, we are so thankful because of Your love. We thank You that You make a way when there seems to be no way. We thank You for providing a way to spend eternity with You. We thank You for the plans that You have for us that are good and not evil. We thank You for Your mercies that are new every morning. And Lord, I just pray for those that are here today and I just speak forth blessings upon them. I ask You to bless them going in and coming out. I ask according to Your Word that You make them the head and not the tail. And Lord, I just thank You for meeting the needs of Your people. I thank You, Lord, for Your greatness. And I thank You, Father, for the destiny of abundance, of joy, peace, and grace that You have provided for us. And we give You all the glory. In Jesus' name, Amen. Amen. Amen.